Gaudeamus omnes in domino, diem festum celebrantes, sub honore sanctorum omni. Welcome to The Way of the Fathers, a podcast sponsored by CatholicCulture.org. I'm your host, Mike Aquilina. In the time between Series 2 and 3, we're exploring trends and themes in the history of the early Church. We're teasing out the concerns of various Church Fathers and the circumstances that called forth their sometimes revolutionary words and deeds. Today we're going to take a close look at the workaday world. We're going to talk about human labor and how the early Christians proposed a radical and new approach to it. Christianity was hardly a hundred years old when a pagan intellectual named Celsus launched a vigorous attack against it. This religion couldn't be true, he argued, because it was made up of shoemakers, cleaners, weavers, and other common laborers. Its god was a carpenter, for heaven's sake. His mother spun cloth, and his great spokesman was a tent maker. How could a religion made up of such lowly people be anything but contemptible? Celsus believed what every gentleman of the Greco-Roman world believed, that it was base and ignoble to do useful work with your hands. The French social historian Paul Vane speaks of the ancients' contempt for labor, their undisguised scorn for those who do work with their hands, their exaltation of leisure as the sine qua non of a liberal life, the only life worthy of a man. And Vane's observation was hardly new. In the 19th century, his countryman, the evangelical historian Charles Schmidt, remarked that work was regarded as a hindrance to public life. It was, he said, despised as servile, degrading to man, making him incapable of virtue, and blunting his intelligence. It was the lot of the slave. End of quote. And it's true. Aristotle echoed the sentiments of Socrates, Xenophon, and Plato when he wrote, quote, The perfection of the citizen cannot be predicated of the man who is merely free but only of the man who is free from such necessary tasks as are performed by serfs, artisans, and manual laborers. No one who leads the life of a worker or laborer can practice virtue. End of quote. Aristotle's contempt for work and workers, Schmidt observed, is foundational to his philosophic theory of social morality. Quote, there are labors, the philosopher decreed, with which a freeman cannot be occupied without degrading himself. Such are those which particularly require bodily strength. But for these labors, nature has created a special class of men. These special beings are those whom we subjugate, in order that they may take bodily labor in our stead, under the names of slaves or mercenaries. And again, Aristotle is hardly alone in this. We have already heard from Celsus. Xenophon fondly recalls Socrates heaping scorn upon shoemakers, public criers, and tent makers. And more than half a millennium later, Plotinus held fast to the old orthodoxy. He said, quote, The mass of manual laborers is a contemptible mob whose purpose is to produce objects needed by men of virtue. End of quote. To the most refined men of the Greco-Roman world, leisure was a virtue, and work was its opposite. It was vicious. It was a vice. Yet Christians never looked at work that way. Celsus was right. The churches were full of laborers who worshipped a laborer, and whose scriptures preserved not the syllogisms of philosophers, but the stories of people who got work done. Abel was a herdsman. Jacob leaned into a plow. Noah was a sailor. Peter and Andrew and James and John were fishermen. Paul was one of those odious tent makers scorned by Socrates. These men got dirty and sweaty every day. They did not belong to the nobility. They were not nobles or they were not aristocrats. And so the tradition-minded Greeks and Romans could dismiss them as ignoble. 
The idea that ordinary labor had tremendous dignity, the idea that ordinary work could be something divine, this set Christians apart from their neighbors. It was one of those crazy Christian ideas that scandalized the pagan world round about, like a crucified god or the finite containing the infinite. And Christians seemed to revel in every insult. Writing around the year 150, Justin Martyr writes like a boxer leading with his chin as he heralds Jesus as the unremarkable carpenter. Quote, he appeared without comeliness as the scriptures declared, and he was deemed a carpenter, for he was in the habit of working as a carpenter when among men, making plows and yokes. In this way, he taught the symbols of righteousness and an active life. Wow. That's revolutionary. By working with his hands, Jesus was teaching us the symbols of righteousness and an active life. Later fathers did not hesitate to portray Jesus working at other trades, working beside Christians of their time. A generation after Justin, Clement of Alexandria wrote the great hymn that cast Jesus as a tamer of wild horses. Wherever you were working, they seemed to say, Jesus was working with you. Indeed, he was working within you and through you. Again, this was a radical notion. The gods of antiquity were projections of the upper classes, and the myths were narratives of the mischief of a leisured life. The mystery cults were open almost exclusively to the leisured classes and sometimes the military. You needed time and money to rehearse the doctrines and undergo the rites. Yet the Christian god was himself a carpenter, whose father in heaven was always toiling away. Jesus told his opponents, My father is working still, and I am working. The Christian preachers who trained new converts gave them a countercultural message. Clement of Alexandria, writing in the last years of the second century, reminded new converts that there was no need for them to quit their jobs, or even to dream of doing so. He said, quote, Tend to your farming if you're a farmer, but know God while you labor in the fields. Sail if navigation is your profession, but invoke always the celestial pilot. Was it in a military career that the knowledge of God first came to you? Well then, obey the commander who orders you to do just things. And such preaching was effective. It worked, and it converted people in every walk of life. Clement's contemporary, Tertullian of Carthage, boasted of the church's explosive growth. He said, We are but of yesterday, and we have filled every place among you, cities, islands, fortresses, towns, marketplaces, the very military camp, tribes, companies, palace, senate, forum. We have left nothing to you but the temples of your gods. End of quote. And the new Christian faith led the faithful not to abandon their duties, but to excel in them. Again, Tertullian made clear that this distinguished Christianity from other world religions. He wrote, quote, We are not Indian Brahmins or gymnosophists who dwell in woods and exile themselves from ordinary life. We do not forget the debt of gratitude we owe to God, our Lord and Creator. We reject no creature of His hands. So we sojourn with you in the world, abjuring neither forum, nor shambles, nor bath, nor booth, nor workshop, nor inn, nor weekly market, nor any other place of commerce. We sail with you, and fight with you, and till the ground with you, and in like manner we unite with you in your transactions. Even in the various arts, we make public property of our works for your benefit. We're not far into Christian history here, and already we see the effects of a revolution. In the world, Christians were as ubiquitous as God, and like their God, they were working still. While Plato, Aristotle, and Plotinus saw necessity as the bane of human life, Christians like Origen of Alexandria celebrated it as the engine of divine providence. Listen to him. He wrote, Quote, the want of the necessities of human life led to the invention, on the one hand, of the art of husbandry, on the other, to that of the cultivation of the vine. 
again, to the art of gardening and the arts of carpentry and blacksmithing, by means of which were formed the tools required for the arts that minister to the support of life. The want of covering again introduced the art of weaving, which followed that of wool carding and spinning, and again that of house building, and thus the intelligence of men ascended even to the art of architecture. The want of necessities caused the products also of other places to be conveyed by means of the arts of sailing and pilotage to those who were without them, so that even on that account one might admire the providence that made the rational being subject to want in a far higher degree than the irrational animals, and yet all with the view to his advantage. End of quote. The origin's writing in response to a pagan opponent, he's positively exuberant about labor. He celebrates every legitimate form of work and even treats the need to work as a gift of a provident, fatherly God. And so it was from the beginning. In the very first pages of the Bible, we learn that man was made in the divine image. Next, we learn that he was made to work and to have dominion over all the creatures of the earth and sea and sky. And he was told to fill the earth and subdue it. In the following chapter, we learn also that the Lord God placed man in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. So man was created in God's image with work as an elemental part of his nature. All of this happened before there's any talk of testing or disobedience or the consequences of sin. In the earthly paradise, long before there was sin, there was work, and it was good. In fact, it was more than good. Work in the beginning was holy. We see this in the way the story is told. Adam is commanded to till the garden and keep it. Some translations say he must work it and guard it. The original Hebrew verbs are abodah and shamar which are elsewhere in the Hebrew scriptures used to describe the work of priests as they tended the sacred rites of the tabernacle. With his creation, Adam is given a task, and that task is priestly. Well, the work of a priest is to offer sacrifice. That's what Melchizedek did. That's what Aaron did. That's what Zechariah did. So what was the stuff of Adam's sacrifice? What was he offering when there was no altar upon the earth? It seems that the entirety of the earth was his offering, and his work was the act of sacrifice. As God equipped Adam for the task of subduing the earth, he was also ordaining him for priestly service. That moment, I believe, is the true Big Bang in any Christian understanding of work. The event remains like background radiation through all the rest of salvation history, informing the way labor and laborers are portrayed in the religion of Israel, and how they're protected and regulated in Israel's law. The background radiation is evident also in the terminology used for the priestly cult. We see in the book of Exodus that it is simply described as service. It's the same term employed to describe the slave labor done for Pharaoh. This implies that there was an ordinariness to the tasks of the priests, but it also suggests that there was something sacred about the tasks of brickmakers, bricklayers, and so on. Greek-speaking Jews preserved this linguistic connection as they denoted their sacred rites by the word liturgia, public work. We still keep the fire going today, whether we use that word's English descendant, liturgy, or we translate it into something more serviceable, like service. We were made for work, and God intended our work to be holy. That doesn't mean it will be easy. After Adam sins, God confronts him with the consequences of his actions, and most of them affect his work. Cursed is the ground because of you, God says. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. Note that work is not a punishment for sin, nor is it a consequence of sin. Because of our sin, however, work is burdensome to us. It can be troublesome and frustrating. 
But from the beginning, it is good. It's holy. It's our sacrifice. And so it was in the life of Jesus, the new Adam. In his hidden life, he reconsecrated labor as he assisted St. Joseph in his workshop. In time, he took up the work of craftsmen, draftsmen, builders, teachers, doctors, and he restored it to its original goodness as he lifted it up to his Father in heaven. He sailed with the fishermen and came to the aid of the wine steward. In all of the work he took up, he established a model for us. He earned the title that went with his trade. The people called him the carpenter, the craftsman, as if it was his name. In all of the work he took up, he applied himself with diligence, sacrificially. As an itinerant teacher, he labored to exhaustion. He traveled far and wide without a place to lay his head. And again, he earned the title that went with his trade. The people called him the rabbi, the teacher, as if it was his name. As he worked to earn those titles, the early Christians gloried in them. They delighted when they shared them. And we see the symbols of all trades inscribed along with the names of Christians throughout the miles of burial chambers in the Roman catacombs. Mock on, mock on, Celsus and Porphyry, the fathers didn't care and neither did their poor and working-class congregations. They knew that Jesus had divinized them at the moment he saved them. They had become partakers of the divine nature, to use the phrase from St. Peter. They were the beneficiaries of the most marvelous exchange, his divinity for our humanity. Because they were baptized, those first Christians knew that they lived in abiding communion with God, his flesh was their flesh, and his blood coursed through their veins. They worked now not with a merely human power, but they endowed their work with divine value. Even Christian ascetics were urged to imitate Christ in their manual labors. The ideal monk, St. Basil wrote, is one whose prayer is augmented by work, but whose work is done so that they may have something to distribute to those in need. So monks needed to work even harder than most folks. And St. Benedict made prayer and work to be the watchwords of his Western reform. And it was all work in that original sense. Benedict referred to the monastic liturgy as Opus Dei, God's work, in which the monks were called to take part. And yet it was their work, too. Still today, in the Western liturgy, we make an explicit offering of our labors, the work of human hands. We do not hesitate to put our work on the altars. The Second Vatican Council, in affirming the common priesthood, proclaimed that all of the laity's ordinary work is placed on the altar with the bread and wine of the sacrifice. Listen to this. Quote, for all their works, prayers, and apostolic endeavors, their ordinary married and family life, their daily occupations, their physical and mental relaxation, if carried out in the spirit, and even the hardships of life, if patiently borne, all these become spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Together with the offering of the Lord's body, they are most fittingly offered in the celebration of the Eucharist. Thus, as those everywhere who adore in holy activity, the laity consecrate the world itself to God. End of quote. To pray, to work, that's what we were made for. That's where we find our fulfillment. And this is a distinctively Christian, distinctively Catholic, distinctively Orthodox way of looking at work. The ancient heretics, after all, did not share our enthusiasm for earthly industry. For the Gnostics and for the Manichaeans, to work was to muck oneself up in the evil creation, to fall further into the trap of the demiurge. And for the record, I want to make clear that I am not recommending discrimination in hiring practices against Valentinians, Sethites, Ophites, or other species of the elect. You and I know better than to discriminate. But we also know better than to blow off our work, or to denigrate work in general, or to work with less than human excellence. No, we have been redeemed to work with divinized hands. We co-create. We perform our labors with a touch that's more efficacious than the touch King Midas had. 
It's not that we repair dishwashers better or raise better crops or write more beautiful poetry than the pagans, but it means that we place what we have on the altar, and that changes everything. On the altar of the cross, even failure was transubstantiated into triumph. Jesus worked with his hands, and so he bestowed the supreme dignity on human labor. For Christians who know union with Christ, labor is not merely good. It is holy. It's an imitation of Christ and a participation with God in the act of creation. This is far more than a work ethic. It's a profound conversion of life. We've been created for this. We've been called for this. We are employed for nothing less than this purpose. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Way of the Fathers. If you did, I ask you to consider making a donation to help us. You can do so by visiting our donation page at catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. We're grateful for anything you can give, and we pray for our benefactors every day. I thank you for listening. De quorum solemnitate Gauden tangeli Et collaudant filium dei Way of the Fathers is a production of catholicculture.org Check out our other podcasts, including Catholic Culture Audiobooks, bringing to life classic Catholic works through professional, high-quality audiobook recordings, Criteria the Catholic Film Podcast, featuring deep analysis of great films from a Catholic perspective, and Catholic Culture Podcast, exploring Catholic arts and culture, issues and ideas with a variety of notable guests. You'll find all of this, as well as Catholic news, commentary, liturgical year resources, and much more at catholicculture.org.